Good afternoon to everyone and welcome again to this, our family life session, God's Blueprint for Marriage and Family Life. And I crave your undivided attention as we look at the second time that is uh, this area of adultery, adultery, divorce, and remarriage. And we're going to use the scripture as, it, as our basis for establishing all of these understanding. Now, this afternoon, we want to continue the part two to what we would have established last week. And I trust that you follow carefully and have your questions reserved uh, at the end of this session. I will present first, and then I will open up for questions, giving you enough time to ask your questions or to make your succinct comments. So let us pray as we look at this most important area. So as I said, health is critically important as well as the gospel, as well as marriage life. And we synchronize all three together as we seek to advance the cause of present truth in this world. Let us pray. Our dear God and Father in heaven, be with us now in a special way. Give us the unction of your Holy Spirit. Impress your truth home to our minds and help us to see that one well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more on behalf of the gospel than all the sermons that can be preached. May we be Christians at home, thus be Christians everywhere else. May we be consistent in our lifestyle and may the truths even in marriage and family life enable us to be better Christians and to prepare for the final events and the end of this world's history, thus vindicating your character and bringing this great controversy to a close. So bless us now to this end, as we have this Holy Spirit fill session, we do crave your Holy Spirit in Jesus name, amen. Or right, welcome again, even to our family life session, uh, just a brief recap as we look back at what some of the things we would have said um, last week. So I trust you are following at this time last week, we began looking at biblical adultery and divorce and remarriage, and we are looking at the part two of this series. Remember, we said that relationships can start out great, and it may be God's will for the person to be married, yeah, that person to be married, but people do change. We mentioned that things do change, and one person may lose their Christian bearings or connection and become promiscuous, cruel, and abusive. God's will may be rejected by that person and one or the other spouse or one of the other spouse may backslide. Just as King Saul and others would have started off right and then ended up committing the unpardonable sin. We said that God intended that marriage be a permanent relationship, not an off and on connection, not a temporary union, but an, a permanent relationship. The scripture puts it like this, what God have joined together, let no man put asunder. Very important indeed. And God never intended divorce from the beginning. The beginning, it was not so. We saw that there are three eras, as it were, that the scripture speaks about, that Jesus mentioned. Moses gave you those laws because of the hardness of your heart. That one time, Moses, period. From the beginning, it was not so. God intended man to be permanently united forever. But then Jesus said, but I say unto you, and he is introducing again the marriage concept, where the question was asked to him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any and every cause? That was the important question. And Jesus said, Moses gave you those laws because of the hardness of your heart. But from the beginning, it was not so. But I say unto you, if a man puts away his wife, except it be for porny, he committed adultery, and whosoever marry of her that is put away and also commits adultery. So he puts away his wife 
except the grounds of porn in, and marries another, he commits adultery. And then Jesus went on to say, whoever marries her that is put away also commits adultery. The disciples understanding Jesus a particular way, very serious about this concept saying, if the case of a man be such, it is better not to marry. And Jesus told them, this is the hard saying. But there are some men who are born eunuchs. There are some men who are made eunuchs. And there are some who make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. That is so serious. Jesus considers, if you're going to get married, stay married. But if you choose to get married and trying to cop out for any and every cause, except it be for porne, committed adultery. Now the word porne does not just mean fornication. As we have said, porne comes from slave prostitution. The word that is used for slave prostitution. And it has to do with unfaithfulness, promiscuity, um, immorality, sexually, all of that, and much more. We will come to that now in a minute. And a challenging area that some people may want to pick up with me, no problem, but I'm going to come straight, the biblical line, all right? So God hates putting away, he hates divorcing, he hates people making vows and not keeping them. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says, when thou, verse 1, when thou makest a vow, a oath, a pledge, a commitment, defer not to pay, for better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou should have vow and break it. And do not offer unto God, he says, the sacrifice of fools. What's the sacrifice of fools? Making oath and vows and pledges and commitments and not willing to keep them. Sacrifice of fools. And that's one of the signs of the last days that the Apostle Paul mentioned. People are without natural affections. People who are truce breakers. That is people who do not keep their vows. We're gonna look at some hard questions this evening as well. But bear with me, all right? Now, let's move on a little further now as we, remember we talk about forgiving one another, learning to forgive, that's critical. Seeking reconciliation, because if we, if we try, if we do not, fail, if we fail to forgive, we are committing sin. And it may be difficult sometimes to forgive, but remember that forgiveness is not for the other person, it is for you. All right? Your duty is to release it. Otherwise, you are drinking poison and hoping the next person is going to die. But forgiveness is for you primarily, setting a prisoner free. Letting go, releasing what you have in your mind against that person. And remember, when we fail to forgive people, we are burning a bridge that we are going to need to cross later in life as well. Very important, forgiveness. There you go. You cannot get back together unless there's forgiveness. All right. And by, and by the way, if the person commits a sin, Jesus said, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. God forgives all sin, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven in this life, nor in the life to come. So when we fail to forgive others, when God looks into the mind, he's going to see just that spirit and attitude, and he cannot, he finds it difficult to forgive people who are cherishing an unforgiving spirit in their heart and soul. Remember the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us from all sin. All right. So if one spouse wants reconciliation, it is possible for that person to be willing to forgive and get help for that other person to be reconciled to them. But if a person has a stubborn, unrepentant attitude on one part, that spouse who desires to reconcile is not bound to and should not force 
their unrepentant partner to stay married to them. And that is brought up in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 15, a very, very important passage of scripture. You can read 1 Corinthians 7 altogether, but it does deal with that unrepentant spirit and forgiveness. Now, we defined the last time what is adultery, and we looked at it as an extramarital sexual encounter or affair that willfully and maliciously interferes with the marital relation between a man and his wife, unfaithfulness to the marriage vow or relationship is how it's described. And we quoted Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, one translation says, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Did Jesus have it right? Luke chapter 16, verse 18 puts it like this. And remember, you have to put all the passages of scripture together and get it bearing on the subject before you draw a conclusion. Do not take one text, like the Apostle Paul using the perfect marriage, if a husband dies, only then is the wife free to marry again, to illustrate the gospel to throughout the term, um, Jesus' exception, which allows for divorce. Paul does not contradict Jesus. So, Jesus says in Luke 16, 18, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. And before that, Jesus talked about the exception to that rule in terms of putting away. So you just can't take a text from its context and then apply it all across the board. You have to take what Jesus says, what Paul says, and what the Old Testament says, and put all together. You will end up with a correct conclusion. And that's just what we did. All right, we mentioned the three periods, Moses' time, the beginning time, and Jesus' time. I say unto you, to establish the important principle that Jesus mentions exceptions for divorce. That means that God does not approve of a divorced person getting married if they did not divorce on biblical ground. And I was checking the spread of prophecy on it, and the spread of prophecy mentioned biblical grounds, scriptural grounds, as it were. And there are grounds to divorce. So as long as there remains a possibility of reconciliation and unification in marriage, a new marriage to a different person is not permissible. It is sin. That question that was asked to Jesus, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any and every cause? Very good question. I think people nowadays want to do that. They want to marry in the presence of witnesses, in the presence of the God of the universe and the angel and all the family members make an oath, a vow, a pledge, a commitment to God in the presence of man, and then want to get out easily, wriggle themselves out. We will look at some of those reasons too before we close, all right? Very important. So God permits divorce, a divorced person to remarry. Well, does God permit a divorced per person to remarry while their former spouse is still alive? If the Divorced person is already has already remarried. Should they get divorced? We answer some of those questions, but I'll go over them again. How does God feel when two people who were divorced get back together with each other in marriage again? Very good questions indeed, even though they are starting new families already. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10, verses 10 and 11, to the married I give this charge. Not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her, to her husband. You saw, see those two options? And the husband should not divorce his wife. Those two options. If she does, 
she should remain unmarried and the husband should not divorce his wife. God does not, not the one who initiate the actions or the divorce. Human beings do. And when they do, we will learn later, God respects the creature's freedom of choice and is forced to give them up to the consequences of that choice. In verse 39 of the same 1 Corinthians 7, we read this verse. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. And that includes only with the exception of the Lord. And the Lord gave an exception. Not to say that a wife is bound to a husband forever if he is breaking the marital laws, threatening the life of the person, the health of the person, the person's sanity. Come into that now. now. So in the case where a former spouse is still alive and sinfully marries a different person, instead of seeking reconciliation, God would not want that second marriage to end in divorce. Even if that spouse who remains, who remarries, realize that he or she had sinned by marrying instead of seeking reconciliation. The Bible teaches that if a person divorces, remarries with a different person, then that second marriage ends for whatever reason, then the original spouse cannot get back together. And that's in the Old Testament, by the way. And I'm not going to read that. I read it last week. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Verse 1 through 4. Okay, so I read that last week. And we said the only exception Jesus gave for remarriage is if the divorce was based on porning the biblical grounds. The Apostle Paul allowed for divorce for abandonment. Now, 1 Corinthians 7, 14 and 15 mentions that. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband, for otherwise your children will be unclean, that is, as it is, but as it is, they are holy. Yet if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. That's First Corinthians 7. 14 and 15, a very important passage of scripture. But did you know that the law of Moses allowed for divorce for abuse? That is a hot topic now. Abuse, I'm not mentioning any and every case of abuse because people will jump on any bandwagon, but I will qualify what I mean by the case or reason of abuse. I have to qualify it. For example, Exodus chapter 21, verses 10 and 11 says, if he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish the first wife, food, her clothing, and her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. Very important. Very important indeed. So in the book of Exodus, if a man took a second wife, it was against God's command to reduce the first wife's food, clothing, or marital right, all that's involved in love. He was not allowed to demote her to slave status. If he was unwilling to treat her as a wife, he had to let her go so she could marry someone who would treat her properly. That was the laws of Moses at that time. And the same is true for prisoner of war wife. A prisoner of war wife, you could let her go. Person would have captured her in battle, during a battle. If a man took a captive as his wife, he had to do her the honor of letting her mourn before sleeping with her as his wife. She must be treated properly, not just raped. So the law of Moses required divorce in cases where a man reduced his wife to a slave or tried to sell her. Very important. 
So a husband could not treat his woman wife any way that he wanted. She was either a wife by with rights or she had to be set free. Now, if that comes up, a question that someone raised last week, um, in the case of Ezra chapter 10, where a lot of the leaders, some of the leaders back then, took wives of the captivity. And then they were told through a messenger of God to put away these strange wives among them. And then they had to call a tribunal and the judges, and they had to decide each case. And they had children from them. And they had to put away those strange wives. Now we have some strange marriages going on nowadays. Call it legal marriages for the sake of citizenship in some country. In God's eyes, how are those considered? Can such be put away? Even though they haven't met the person, sometimes they don't know the person, they meet them at the courthouse and they sign a document for legal purposes to become a citizen. As far as God's word is concerned, those count for nothing. They have not entered into the person. They have, they have no love as the bond. They are not committed. They never made a commitment of loyalty to that person sexually or emotionally. And yet they have drawn into a legal contract arrangement. Well, if we ask forgiveness for such light of taking the commitment of making an oath, then there are consequences that follow. We cannot do things as we please and then expect God to sanction it. I'm trying to be consistent here because I know that these things do operate. So now, I like the way how one, uh, two authors who wrote a book put it, uh, Justin and Lindsay Holcomb. They said, this sounds like abusive marriage, abusive marriages today, where a woman has abusive marriages today, where the woman has no voice and no power. That's the, or, or Moses, Moses' uh, idea of how men used to treat women or want to treat women. All she can do is obey like a slave. When a man chooses to be abusive, he breaks the covenant, an abusive man forfeits the right to remain married. Let's get into some depths on that. So how can we be sure, sure that abuse and substance abuse are serious in God's eyes? God doesn't want abusive people in church. And we do have husbands who beat their wives and are very physically abusive and emotionally abusive. The Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth to end their association with any sexually immoral, drunk, emotionally or financially abusive person. Paul is very clear on that. All right. He, he mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You should not associate with those people who claim to be Christians but are immoral, promiscuous and so on. Don't even eat with them, Paul says. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, Paul says, but now I'm writing to you that, that you not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or a sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. Have you ever been called such? I've been called a slander at one point for repeating something that we had as a memorandum in our church, at our meeting. And it was just repeating what the memorandum said. But some people take things very seriously. Just at a wedding, at one time I said that a husband and wife are to stick together like glue forever and the husband is in charge of his wife. And a lady walked out of the church. She didn't want to hear that. So sometimes people have certain ideas in their minds of things that they think that you are saying 
but we have to listen very carefully to what is being said. And anybody, the Apostle Paul says, we are not to partner with, with those kinds of Christians. Such Christians are deceivers. They aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. And we hear a lot of talk nowadays about being unequally yoked all the time. We hear that talk unequally. I'm going to touch on that in a minute. Unequally yoked and what it involves. But this verse says we shouldn't be partner with Christians who do so who do such things. Paul is very clear. And as a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, 3 to 7, Paul says, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kinds of impurity and of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For the, of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such as a person who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Do not partner with them. Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. So do not be partners with them, Paul says. Very important, very important indeed. All right, I must um, move on. All right. Now we mentioned about a case of um, abandonment the last time. Paul mentions about a case of behavior that was so bad that Christians, that professed Christians are to be thrown out of the church according to 1 Corinthians 5, 11 and 12. And Ephesians 5, 3 to 7. Uh, thrown out doesn't mean physically thrown out, but it means not registered as a member of that body and not considered to have the privileges of that body. Some people say you don't put a person in the back seat. No, the person may not be put in the back seat. They may be put allowed to come to the front seat, but they take a back seat in the church when it comes to functioning. So if you're a practicing sinner, why should you be functioning in the church before the believers? What can you teach the believers? You can only give what you have. And if you don't have it, you can't give it. If you don't have, you can't give in part what you do not have. You can only communicate what you have. So if a person is lukewarm, they will communicate a lukewarm religion and doctrine. So it's important to understand what Paul means. Now, if God wants the church to reject them, and Paul said you should put them out, withdraw yourself from such a person. If God wants the church to reject them, how can you ask a spouse to tolerate more than God does? That's a good question to ask. If in God's eyes, this person does not inherit the kingdom of God, then they are an unbeliever. Even though they believe some things that you believe, yeah, but they are not practicing it. They become unbelievers. If they abandon their duty, Christians are given permission by God, given permission to divorce in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 15. Given permission to divorce. Notice that language. So those who have abandoned their obligation to their spouse are also considered to have denied their faith and are even worse than unbelievers. That situation falls into 1 Corinthians 7, 15, abandonment by an unbeliever. So a person was a believer before and then backslide, they become an unbeliever. And a person is not bound to be connected to that person if they choose not to. So the Bible says, if the unbeliever wants to depart, let him depart. A man or a woman is not under bondage in such cases. What a statement. You can read it for yourself. First Corinthians 7 verse 15, abandonment. All right. Now, 
He said that divorce was a turning point, an eye-opening moment, when you know that you must get out of your marriage to save your life and your sanity and your children. Notice my words carefully. Now, there were interviews that were done with people who were uh, who have dealt with a lot of divorcees. I myself would have dealt with some of them. There were interviews done with people who love God, take their beliefs seriously, yet finally divorce. That's a good question. Divorcing? They take their beliefs seriously. There are people who love God and yet they finally divorce. They hung on no longer and tried harder. They hung on longer and they tried harder than most people would have done. They were in marriages where there was a pattern, notice my words, a pattern of adultery, sexual immorality, domestic violence, chronic emotional and verbal abuse, abandonment or neglect due to addiction. These are the same strong people in terms of their belief who love the Lord and they're finally divorced. Research interviews were done with hundreds of them and reasons were given as to why. People of faith stay longer, that is true, and they endure worse treatment in these painful marriages than most people. They often prefer a bad marriage to a divorce. And my question to you is, which is better? A bad marriage or a divorce? And if they are surrounded by friends and family who value marriage at all costs, they are very hesitant to leave and they will feel guilty leaving unless their lives are otherwise miserable, very miserable and threatening. And they prefer to live in that condition than get help or make radical choices and decisions. Abuse and betrayal are not how marriage is supposed to be. You get a husband or a wife that have betrayed the other again and again, even though they were forgiven and spoken to. They're neglected and abandoned. All efforts made and they were rejected. Abuse and betrayal are not how God supposed wanted marriage to be. And it's not the way God designed love to work between a husband and a wife, not God's way. Victims of abuse often gain immense confidence, validation, and freedom through understanding what abuse looks like and how it works. Only when it is explained to them clearly do our people's eyes open to make a decision. Another person, one person said, don't blame yourself for provoking the abuse in your relationship. Well, if he didn't love me, then I beat me so. It's because he loves me that he beats me like this. Broken hand, broken leg, and the face swollen. And if he didn't love me, he wouldn't have beat me like this. He loved me very much. That person is deluded. Don't blame yourself for provoking the abuse in your relationship. In a healthy relationship, you can make mistakes. That's true. You can get angry or even be critical and not pay such a high price. You are not the cause of their partner's rage or anger or violence, and you cannot be the cure either, one authority said. But let's look at five types of control and abuse. And I mean, I mean control to the point where people's lives are threatened. I will give you examples in a minute. Five types of control and abuse. One, physical abuse. What is that? Physical abuse is the willful infliction of physical pain or injury, such as slapping, bruising, sexually molesting, or restraining. Of course, there are more covert methods, and I'm not saying that you can divorce for any and every cause of abuse. There are more covert methods such as you abuse, such as blocking a person's way, sleep deprivation, physical abandonment, 
displaying uh, uh, some even more serious one, displaying weapons of what they plan to do if, and giving you drugs or medicine without your consent. Now those are very serious cases of abuse. And not any and every one of a partner is snoring at night that you can't sleep, leading to sleep deprivation. That is not a reason for divorce. Even if a partner hits a person once, that is not a reason for divorce. But if it becomes a consistent pattern, then you need to get help for that person. And if the person doesn't want the help or is rejecting the effort, you give a little more time to see if there's any change in their pattern of behavior. And if there's no change, the best way out of that relationship is through the door. Now, some people may disagree immediately, thinking that people ought to remain in a life-threatening marriage situation, threatening their health, or threatening their children to remain faithful to God. Christ endured suffering and deprivation. Is that the same thing? Christ was never married. Christ never made an oath to anyone. Is that the same thing? Serious thing. Verbal, emotional, mental. The verbal, I won't marry so much. People can say what you want. You have no control of what people say. But if the person reaches the point where they are controlling you, where they are taking away your very sanity, where that person is dominating your will, Friend, you got to get help for that person, but you can't get it while remaining in the marriage situation. Emotional and mental abuse to the infliction of mental and emotional anguish, such as humiliating or threatening language and treatment. And there are people who go into lying, accusing, isolating, blaming, denying, demeaning, manipulation, through put down and demanding to know where you go and who you're spoken to. Those are not reasons for divorce per se. You can work with a person like that, seeking true counseling and true getting help for the person to overcome those. But we're not even talking about those so much. In communication, in relationships, when in communication is involved, those kind of things happen. Lying, accusing, isolating, blaming, denying, demeaning, manipulation, put downs. Those happen in marriages and they should not happen, but they do happen. But that is not a justification for divorce per se. That goes beyond that. Chronic manipulation in which the abuser causes the victim to, uh, to, to, to question their identity, their judgment, their self-worth, and their perceptions of reality, that is danger zone. That is danger zone. And you continue a relationship with it like that, what's gonna happen? Spread of Rossi gives a case of one person who was selling a person mentally insane. And the person was told to get out of that relationship. Hard words, eh? but it is true. Those who choose to let people remain in their affair are responsible for their death when it comes, if it comes. Then there's financial or material exploitation. Sometimes people live with these kind of things where husbands deprive their wives, don't give them anything. They buy everything for them that they need, in case, even feminine um, toiletries and so on. The husband buys everything and dehumanizes the femininity of the female, now that's a problem. Of course, men do it with women, women do it with men too. Financial or material exploitation is another form of abuse in which the money, the credit, the belongings of a spouse are used or withheld without their consent. Now I am saying that when that heart happens, that is not a reason for divorce. But when you see a perpetual pattern and you try to get help for the person, and the person is refusing to comply. They are not changing their course. You see that there's a mindset involved. Sooner or later, your life will come into question. And if you choose to want to leave, they will say, if I can't get you, 
nobody else will. Now be careful there. That is why some women go to places for battered women and nobody knows except some social work agencies who are responsible for that. Battered, uh, the location where battered women are kept. Now some people say that, that includes running up the debt, making major purchases and withholding information about joint taxes, banks and credit cards. Those are issues that can be worked through because those do not impact directly on your physical health and well-being in terms of your living. It's true in the long run because they're withholding the debt, but if they're using it and providing food, you should find some way to get help. And if there's no way to get help for that person or that person is not willing to receive the help, I'm choosing my word carefully so nobody take me out of context then you have to start considering other alternatives for your own sanity. Neglect is a failure of a car caretaker to provide goods and services necessary to avoid physical harm, mental anguish, and illness. Things such as food, water, clothing, and shelter, medical care, and a safe environment. Those are cases of abuse, yes. Yeah. But unless the person is doing it, to take your life, take your sanity, take your health away, you know that you are not in a safe environment there. In marriage, it also includes withholding affection, but that is not a reason for divorce. There are many spouses who go through the withholding of affection from them, sexual intimacy. For years, the partner doesn't want to respond at all, something wrong. But if it's a Christian wife or a Christian husband, they would be more considerate because they have the spirit of Christ and understand that they are not just object, sexual objects to be used, but to love. Objects or individuals to love. Then we talk about spiritual abuse. Spiritual abuse is the willful use of religious belief. Now here's where fanaticism comes in. Religious beliefs to manipulate or shame one spouse into giving control to the other spouse who lords it over their partner. Rather than giving each spouse the responsibility to follow a loving God above any other person. It, also, it is also spiritually abusive to use religious sayings, scriptures, threats of divine punishment, threatened withdrawal of divine favor or blessing, or a negative spiritual judgment about your character to make you remain in a dangerous situation. I'm not saying that that's a reason, but it becomes a repeated pattern and you are observing what abuse is. That's why you need to see a Christian counselor or professional counselor. See that repeated pattern, it leads to threatening your life and danger eventually. And those are fanatics. Some men who keep their wives in bondage at home and they cannot leave, they cannot talk on the phone, they cannot look at a, another male, they cannot do a number of things. They cannot be seen talking with an old friend from school, be careful. People who claim to have prophetic authority to tell you what to do with your life. You ever heard about such? Or who claim special knowledge about God's mind and will that people like you don't have rather than recognizing your ability to hear from God directly are also being spiritually abusive. We had a case in the Barbados News where a woman was told that she had seven demons and to have them cast out, the pastor told her she had, had, she had to have sex with him seven times. Only around the third or so did somebody talk some sense into her and she eventually took it to court. It's Barbados News, public news. That spiritual abuse can be perpetrated 
by one spouse against another spouse. But it can also be perpetuated by pastor, people who have control and influence over the minds of the vulnerable or the naive. Yes, by some ministers as well, religious leaders, or an entire religious community against an individual whose well-being is at stake. Are we talking about abuse in some country? We talk what men do to women in church? Betrayal, a breach of trust, fear, that keeps people paralyzed. What you thought was true, counted on to be true, was not true. It was just smoke and mirrors, outright deceit and lies. Sometimes it was hard to tell because there was just not enough truth to make, it, make everything seems right. Even a little truth with just the right spin can cover the outrageous. Some people tell, some pastors tell the members, God wants you to come as you are. So all the artificial things that you cover yourself with, you have to come to God as you are. And these people believe that you have to come to a priest sometime and confess. It is a shame, Paul says, of the, some of the things that they do in darkness. So what is God's will for divorce and remarriage? Once you have divorced on the biblical grounds, you have the right, if it is God's will, and that is what you should seek first, to be remarried. Coming down to a close. Let's look at a few myths as we close. Some myths, no, sorry, before we touch on one other aspect. Listen to some of these myths. Are you listening? Some of these myths that are perpetrated. He wouldn't cheat or watch porn if you gave him more sexual fulfillment. That's true. Ain't true? No. Cheating or sexual abuse is never justified in the eyes of God. Your spouse is sexual addiction or pedophilia, pedophiles liking children, those minor, can't be fixed by giving them more sex. The truth is that you cannot cure someone else's sexual addiction or deviant sexual behavior by having more sex with them. There are no acceptable reasons for cheating, just excuses. What are they? There are no reasons for cheating. No acceptable reason, only excuses. That's all that's given. And we are not to accept those excuses. You see, most people mistakenly think it is possible to prevent affairs by being loving and dedicated to one's partner, which is important. But sometimes the prevention myth sets in because there's no evidence to support it. Experience as a marital therapist has shown me that simply being a loving partner does not necessarily ensure your marriage against affairs. A person may just want to experiment. They may be promiscuous or perverted in their minds. So there's no excuse. If a spouse cheats, if a spouse cheats, the innocent spouse can forgive. You hear what I just said? If a spouse cheats, the innocent spouse can forgive. But building a trusting marriage cannot happen until the adultery stops. Anyone can forgive a single incident. In fact, many people do. But serial adulterers, notice what they're called, Serial adulterers, in fact, they don't usually stop. They cheat, then come home to a loving spouse who pays the bills, keeps the household running, puts food on the table, and makes sure the kids are cared for. Many serial adulterers don't leave or file for a divorce. Why? Why should they? They got the best of both worlds. When a man or woman is sexually fulfilled in their marriage relation and as sexual desires increase, divorce from adultery increases too. Possible causes, 
when men are sexually fulfilled at home, they are less likely to look elsewhere. Is that not true? Less likely. What is the term? Human and biological needs are satisfied. And they're still not 100% guaranteed. Some because some people are perverted and immoral. So they stay in the relationship because at least they're getting some degree of fulfillment. One set of statistics from North America said 92% of cases studied showed when divorce time from adultery occurred that is when there was some type of abstinence and one person kept themselves away from the other. What a statement. Formula for perfect lasting relationship free from adultery and divorce. What's the formula? High frequency of sexual fulfillment in marriage motivated by true love. No premarital sex that is restraining and abstaining from fornication, as God's word says. And the older and mature the woman or the man is getting married. So people who are much more mature and older when they get married, chances are reduced and they have a higher chance of having an enduring lasting relationship that is free from adultery and divorce. Now, what's the best way to avoid adultery? I think I gave some hints to this already, Matthew 15, 19. Matthew 15, 19 says that from the heart, from the heart, Proceed all manner of evil thoughts from the heart. All manner of sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander, thoughts, murder, originate from the heart. So the seeds of adultery are planted in the garden of the heart. You might have grown up seeing certain things. You might have watched certain things. You might have heard certain things. Remember, your diet is not only what you eat. Guard what is planted in your heart through what you read, watch, think about to avoid growing the fruit of adultery. The consequences of adultery are severe and lasting. How do we know that? The wise man Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32, the man who commits adultery is an utter fool, for he destroys his own soul. Imagine that, like most sins, Adultery is a momentary act of pleasure that has these dire, has, has dire consequences. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10 says that if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, both the man and the woman must be put to death. That's the Old Testament, we say. In Bible times, adultery was considered so evil that it demanded the death penalty. Imagine how many men would be executed if this law were to be enforced today and women as well. All right, I'm skipping a few. So the Bible gives some reasons for divorce. Quickly summarizing one, death. That's the obvious one. Romans 7, 2, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives. If her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. And 1 Corinthians 7, 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry to whomsoever she wishes, only in the Lord. So death is obvious, number one. Neglect and abandonment, 1 Corinthians 7, 15. If the unbelieving wants to depart, if the unbelieving partner departs, separate, let it be so. In such cases, a brother or sister is not enslaved, that is not in bondage, neglect or abandonment. Adultery and sexual immorality or sexual promiscuity. Deuteronomy 22, 22. If a man is found lying with his wife of another man, both of them shall die. That's the old covenant, right? Some people say it was right. the old testament. Matthew 5, 32. Anyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality as in the new covenant, Jesus packed it in there. Whosoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, the fourth reason is that one, just one minute. The fourth reason is one that people don't hardly, hardly consider. 
but it is there in the Bible. And they don't consider it because they don't see it. Something called the hardness of heart. What did Jesus, Jesus say in Mark 10, 5 to 9? They said Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, wrote you those commandments. But from the beginning, notice that Moses gave you those commandments because of the hardness of your heart. And that was acceptable to God at that time. But from the beginning, it was not so. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife, hold fast his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. But there's something called the hardness of heart. What does that include? Husbands or wives that have become heartless. Include physical and emotional abuse. When repeated and threatening, when the partner is a threat to the other person's life, health, or sanity, as in the case of a person who came home, the husband used to threaten her every day, but this time she came home and saw the husband sharpening, sharpening a sword, talking angrily and sharpening a sword. What happened as a result? She stood there, she cooked her food, she remained quiet, and she waited until it was dark and he was asleep. Listen carefully. She took up her belongings and went through the door. Walked all the way about 10 miles home to her mother's house and never went back to that person. That could have been her last night on planet Earth. Sharpening a weapon. We have a, I have a personal experience of a husband that was seen. I was going to visit my sister and I saw a husband beating his wife. He found out after they were married, beating his wife all the way while well on the street and she was bleeding. And when my sister was sent, trying to plead with them, plead with him. But he assumed that she came back home late because she went with another person, partner, another man. And when they went into the house, my sister went in and I managed to reverse my car just in time to slip into the house to see the husband going for what we call a cut loss, a Collins, an act, something like an act. People may not understand the term Collins. He wanted to cut off the wife's head. And there am I between the wife and the husband with my hands stretched out and my head in between. This is a real occurrence. And I plead in using all the negotiation skills, all the communication skills, all the conflict verbal, non-verbal non language possible. Eventually got angry, tell her, tell her to leave right now. I said, woman, get your clothes, let's go. I put her in my car and I took her to her family's residence to a country area. They never came back together. That could have been her last day on planet Earth. But of course that involves a risk. But when people persist also in, as an example in incestuous sexual relationships, should the wife continue in that marriage, quote unquote, marriage? How about a person practicing a homosexual or pedophilia lifestyle? or practicing bestiality, or another repulsive practice or lifestyle? Should a person insist that they should stay in that relationship? You see, the categories that I mentioned there are in order from easiest to the most difficult to evaluate. If someone no longer is alive, obviously marriage has ended and they can remarry. If someone has abandoned the marriage, moved far away in an effort to disappear or not have any relationship, or even a serving a life sentence in prison, then it is impossible to have a marital relationship. That's obvious too. Sexual immorality, including adultery, is sometimes obvious and often hidden and secret. That's the third one. But lastly, hardness of heart is admittedly a judgment call. 
That's what keeps people in relationship. But people with an ongoing hard heart against God and their spouse do some very awful and painful things that make the relationship unhealthy, unsafe, and unlivable. After a few decades of ministry as a senior minister, I have walked with people through some unimaginable experiences. And I won't repeat some of these because some of them are unspeakable. But this is also in harmony with God's character of love. God does not give up on people and he hates putting away. He loves us dearly and pursues us with, uh, towards the end of reconciliation. But when individuals choose to separate, pursue a course that is contrary to his will and way, and persist in stubborn rebellion, unwilling to change or listen to anyone or to get help, he is forced to leave them alone withdraw or gives them up or gives them over to the consequences of their choices. That's called the wrath of God. God's wrath means giving people up, God's respect for creatures, freedom of choice, and his being forced to give them up to the consequences of their choice. You know, another factor, just before it was on, uh, another factor which contributes to high divorce rate among seven of the Adventists is intermarriage with those of other faiths. When we disobey God's direct command, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, we're going to find ourselves in trouble in our relationship with those not of our faith. When the Bible talks about being unequally yoked with unbelievers, does that include those not of our faith or those who do not practice our beliefs? Question. Are the watchmen on the walls of Zion to say nothing on these issues when members are being influenced in the wrong direction by marrying those of the Jehovah's Witness or the Catholic faith, faith or those organizations which constitute Babylon in these last days of Earth's history? Or should they give the trumpet a certain sound of what the Bible present truth and the spread of prophecy says on such matters? Will some individual members lose their soul salvation eternally by following the advice of others, by marrying those not of their faith or beliefs. For example, those who don't accept the Sabbath truth or hold strange and damnable heresies are the watchmen to remain quiet. I tell you, I was gonna close with some practical recommendations, but I'm gonna stop right there and I'll continue that before I Wrong door. Any questions that anyone has at this time? Yeah, good evening, Adelika. Um, I just have a quick good question. Evening. Be quick, Don. Yes, yes, sir. Um, just wanted to know, um, in a relationship like that of Enoch, um, you know, he was translated. What about his wife? Would his wife is it okay for him, is it okay, sorry, is it okay for his wife to go with another partner or in a relationship, like, because this deals with the transition of the resurrection. In a relationship, in the, in the, in the, in the aspect of the situation with Lazarus, um, Lazarus was living, he died and was resurrected. Should his wife pick another partner or should she have waited like Enoch's wife in that case, I'm not sure. Just ask what those who just thank you. Yeah, first, let me start with the second one, Lazarus, that was day. If she should have taken another partner. Correct. After Lazarus' death. I, 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 yes, I can't sorry, tell sorry. you yes to that. Uh, I believe that if she had a partner like Lazarus, yes. she should remain faithful and committed to God for having mm -hmm. had such a husband. Mm -hmm. Unless the need arises, that's a matter to pray to ask the Lord. But Lazarus was resurrected. I think those some of those women back then had a certain level of spirituality. Amen. And they were not quick to remarry. In I, the I, case of Eli, um, he, uh, cause, Enoch. Yeah, because in the case, because you know there's going to be a partial resurrection. So if Enoch, if he not walk so with God, God, it means that his wife, if she was loyal and faithful, had to be walking with him. But God saw fit to translate Eli, um, 
Enoch, Enoch, Enoch. yeah. So as a faithful and committed wife, she would follow the example of her husband and mm -hmm. walk with God. Praise the Lord. And be faithful. Thank God. Beautiful answer. Oh, to no, God, women question. don't Thank rush you. into next relationship till uh, unless they have dealt with a number of issues. And uh, I'm not getting the impression because nothing is mentioned about Enoch's wife after his resurrection, after his translation. Next question. I have some questions here. Um, I cannot answer speculative areas. All right. Some people said they were seeing a black screen when I was talking. I trust you were hearing me. Um, yeah, we all were. Hold on. So what if a woman or a man was put away legally? What would it be if another person comes along, meets that person who was put away in time past and marries them? That's no problem. We have an example of that in the book Selected Messages, book two, page three, three nine. Read it for yourself. A three K four K scenarios are given and elevates counsel to those people who paid away legally, legally, but not but not spiritually, uh, uh, the biblical grounds. Is that what you were referring to? So what if a woman or a man was put away legally? That is, you give a written legal document. In God's eyes, if it did not have biblical grounds, you are still married to that person, according to God's word. So therefore, it would not be right for you to go and marry another person, as a, a person, especially if that person was put away in the past. It is not advisable. Read the three, four scenarios that are given in selected messages. This is one of them. And counsel that is given not to not to encourage the young lady who wanted to marry a man that was put away, and this was the case of not spiritually, not fulfilling the spiritual biblical grounds. Um, I never saw in the Bible where Nazareth was married. Me neither. So I was just answering the questions upon, upon uh, Kamal's hypothetical um, assumption. But I don't know. I know Lazarus, Mary, and Martha was living together. Unless you can find the evidence that he was married and had a family. But if that was the case, um, then right, the government right. back then remained faithful. Now, the question about in Ezekiel, I mean, Ezra chapter 10, had to do with wives from captivity or bondage, which God had previously told them not to do not to marry any of those women that were caught captives or to be involved with them. But some of the leaders went, got involved with them, had children from them. And here was God saying that they should put them away. So they were they had violated a command that was given. Now they violated the command. The, the command from the Lord was given to put them away, the strange wives. So I don't think, and I remember that you read it carefully, there was a council and there were, there were judges that were supposed to preside over individual matters and then make a decision. That's why it's good to be open to counsel right. because many people make decisions and choices and they don't want any counsel from anybody. One of the chief things that you need counseling for is marriage. Otherwise, you're going to be jeopardizing your future happiness. A question here. Can a woman leave a marriage if the husband has sexually abandoned her and is continually refusing to go for counseling and is constantly abusing her? The answer is yes. You have labored with the person. You seek to get help for the person. The person is stubbornly rejecting counsel, don't want to ameliorate the relationship, don't want to seek help to make the marriage any better. You would be preparing yourself for death by remaining in a relationship, um, a depressed mood, remain in a relationship that is not fulfilling, satisfying, abusive, and abandoning. That's, that, we have an example of that. 
in the same selected masjid book two, three, um, three, three, nine, where a person left another, was involved in a relationship with another, got married to the other. The other person was very faithful, committed, and loyal, and true, and pleaded with the person. And now they're married to somebody else. And the way it calls him L. L is the person who wanted to marry another individual or married another individual. And she said, this one is for the Lord. I see no reason why she should leave this one, but that this relationship is for the Lord. He abandoned her. She abandoned him when he was pleading with her, made every effort and so on towards reconciliation. And nothing is wrong with this new marriage, as it were, that has been contracted. So this is right, a similar right. situation. Right. Even a marriage, if the husband was sexually, has sexually abandoned her or the wife sexually abandoned the husband, continually refusing to go for counseling, she had moved on with her life. And he had a choice to remain single the rest of his life or to be married to someone else in the Lord. And the wife said, this relationship is of the Lord rather than the right. other one. I have a question. This person was abused emotionally and abandoned. So that right. answers that question. Read Selected Message Book 2, 339. Very important. Any other question? Good night, sir. This is Adrian. Good night. Why is it that some of our ladies prefer to be involved in man but outside the church rather than in the church? I'm not clearly understanding you. Go again. Why would a woman get involved with a man from outside the church rather than in the church? A very good question. A woman would do that because she is not spiritually connected to Christ. And she is more okay. concerned about having her physical, emotional, or sexual needs being met. Or she may think less about herself than God thinks about her or that others may think about her. Or she may just be a promiscuous type of person that would have come into church, but then give in to that promiscuous tendencies again. There are a number of reasons a woman, because it takes a lot from a woman to do that. Okay, okay. For a man, he's easily aroused and he can give in to touch, feeling, a promise, anything like that. But not so with a woman. Women have to break down. Women have to build up emotionally to be connected and involved with another man. And she's not I, getting her needs met. Okay. And she's starting to give in to feelings. She may move that direction. And looking for love, they want to give in. Sometimes it happens so quickly that people have no even a chance to say no. They and give in to the emotions. The emotions take control of the mind. Okay, okay. And then after that, they are no longer in control. And then Same thing for a man, too. Which can the church? In church. They have a lot of women have left because they got pregnant from yeah. other men outside the church. And many a time when they get involved with people who are not of their faith, Correct. not of their belief system, not of that, especially Adventist okay, okay. mold or mind, they usually get some things happening in their marriage which they regret. Sadly, that's why I like to give people uh, two passages to read in the Spirit of Prophecy. One called scriptural marriage on scriptural marriages another one called marriages that are forbidden by god forbidden marriages two passages i usually give people to read before they marry such a person they get back to me and so on i don't mind or say that i'm saying that they are evil i don't mind but they have to get the counsel read the counsel and then when they come out when, the when they come out to church they come out shame Side. And later on, they will come to their senses by the prodigal son. Okay, okay. All right. Any Thanks. other question? So you are saying that you should marry any man in the church? So you are saying that you should marry? I am not saying that because you may have a person in the church and you may not be compatible with that person, whether it be educationally, spiritually, may not be at the same level of maturity. You may not be uh, 
You know, be even be attracted to that person in the church. So I am not saying you should marry any of the first per the first things for consideration are maturity, qualities, and love for a person. And then everything else comes afterwards. I'm not asking you to marry a person you're not attracted to. So you must be attracted to that person. You must study their quality. You must get to know them so that you can understand if you in fact love them. Even if a person gets pregnant, a sister in church, is no reason for marriage. You should wait till after the baby is born. After all of that emotional hyped up and situations that occur in the church, when people leave and get pregnant outside and then blame elders and others for condemning them. And in fact, condemnation comes from within. You should wait until after the baby is born and then decide if you still love the person and if you want to continue to marry them. So, but the pregnancy is not a reason for marriage. I have warned people about this, to which they have ignored the godly counsel. But I have nothing to say. I respect their choice. All I can do is leave them to the consequences of their choice. In the very area sometimes that people need counseling is the very area that we reject counseling. Um, Adelika, yes, sir. yes, sir. Would you believe um, that Mary should have? Uh, I, I pause when I ask this question because it came to my mind and it was. But, okay. but, but, but Kamal, I cannot speculate in those areas. Ah, you mean okay. after no Joseph problem. died? Or am I jumping mm. the gun? No, 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 no. I was asking, sorry, no, I was just asking if Mary should have continued to get um, the Lord's brother James because she was. Um, technically, well, she could have been married to God because she had Jesus. So she, so th then you would have to ask, why then would you have sex with a with, with 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 Joseph? Because because technically, she, you entered into relationship by by receiving the promise from the angel, and the angel said, "Fear, fear not, Mary, thou that are highly favored." And she said, but "Joseph, children, you're talking about exactly, yeah, yeah, not Mary, children, Jesus." Mary. Oh, we had uh, Jesus. Ah, yes, because that's how it goes in, in, in Yes, thank you. Sorry Children that. of Joseph, as the right. brothers of Jesus were called. Yes, right. I don't go into speculation, though. That's a dangerous area. Yeah, that's that's a that that was a real yeah. That was a serious question because you because there was no other woman in the history of time that ever had a relationship outside of a man. So right. All right, if there are no further questions, I will have to just close. I have um, four more slides with some practical recommendation. Practical recommendation, your heart is wrong. If you are actively seeking to meet some criteria for divorcing your spouse, your heart is wrong. If you are trying to figure out the grounds for divorce, so that you can get your relationship to qualify, then you have a heart problem. You wanna trade in for a new model and that excuse, not reason, that excuse is not gonna work. Not in the eyes of God who sees our motives and our thoughts. You, secondly, you do not have the divorce, even if you have grungster, you can forgive, they're patiently with, the person may change, and you may make it a stronger relationship. Couples can and do forgive one another. They work through a process of healing. I've seen that happen with a pastor or counselor, and some make it through awful times at a wonderful times. Thirdly, you, don't, you cannot make this decision in isolation about divorce. The issue of divorce is so complicated, especially where children are involved that discreet, wise counsel needs to be invited in. These people cannot be friends and family who take your sides. They, are, they cannot be friends and family who take your side. But godly people seeking to help everyone involved to find God's side, a professional counselor, a godly pastor. 
You cannot make this decision in haste either. That's divorcing another person. Some people do it in haste. When you're in anger or hurt, you should make those decisions. You should not make those decisions when you are angry or hurt. Sometimes we make short-term decisions that we later regret. You cannot make a decision like this in loss because you want this other person. This other person is better than your spouse. If you have an emotional and or a physical relationship with someone other than your spouse, and your motivation for divorce is to move on to another person, then your reasoning and motives are polluted. They're wrong. Which keep you from walking in God's will. It is unfair, unjust, and unhealthy to make only one person in the marriage obey biblical commands. Through the Bible, God repeatedly speaks to both husbands and wives about their roles and responsibility. And therefore, both husband and wife shall be lovingly encouraged to obey God and trust him for the outcome of their relationship. Those are some recommendations I've given you right there. Godly recommendation. Thank you. So, so I've spelled out clearly the issues of adultery, divorce, and remarry. Might not have covered all the grounds, but we have covered so efficient, sufficient ground based on God's word and even those who uh, uh, may need inspiration comments for further reading to understand that God takes this matter of his blueprint for marriage and family life seriously. It damages children and causes them to lose their way and be lost because of bad decisions and choices. Not supporting children that you would have brought into this world some people have no contact with them, no financial support, no emotional support. The Apostle Paul says that such people are worse than infidels. What a statement. And if you cause a person to stumble, Jesus said, to be offended, it were better that a millstone were hang about your neck and you were to be cast into the deepest part, deepest part of the ocean. So make it right with your children whom you have brought into this world. Make sure that you support them, provide for them, take care of them. Otherwise, you are worse than an infidel. And when people divorce from their spouses and abandon their children, they are treating them just like those who are worse than infidel. May God bless you. Thank you for listening, for your question. And I trust that you will come to the reader or listen over even to what you have heard. Let us pray. Gracious God and Father, thank you for this session. Continue to teach us by your spirit what we need to know as your blueprint for marriage and family life today. Give us the guidance of your spirit. Teach us to be humble, to be trustful, and to walk in your way, and to be willing to sacrifice even for your cause. Thank you for being with us in this session. Continue to teach us by your spirit. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.